Um, so today is lecture 10 for the module on material processing. Um, and what we're going to do is um, talk a little bit more about special processes. I've been spending a lot of time with you guys on more traditional processes um, over the past month. And um, I'm going to give an overview of, I guess, more, a little bit more of the cool stuff. Um, and at the end of today is what I'd like you to use for your class summary that's due Monday. So um, it's the 12th. Um, so for the module I did live this semester, this is lecture 10. And what we're going to do is uh, today is I'll give you guys a little bit my view of, of the summary. And then when we get to next week, we, uh, we're going to have two more lectures, so the 17th and 18th. So um, here we'll be talking about corrosion uh, in the context of aluminum, steel, uh, stainless steel. And uh, so that's lecture 11. And then here is going to be a little bit more up to what I see in the class summary. What what I thought should be emphasized. So we'll call this a recitation here. Um, I'll organize it based again on, on, on reviewing you guys' individual summaries. So your summaries are due here, and that's, and that's why I'm not going to ask you to talk about corrosion in, in your module summary. Um, I, the last logistic is tomorrow and Friday. We don't have any lectures, so you, it's a little bit intended for you guys to get ready for your student presentation coming up. The student presentation are starting on the 19th, and there's already been a few requests to move time uh, for a number of reasons, interviews or you know a conflict with an exam and all that. What we understand is, um, yeah, we have to be flexible, but we ask if you can find somebody in the class to switch with. So there's no. Uh, real change in the schedule. Uh, Professor Eager worked pretty tightly to put everybody in for their 20 minutes. So um, the idea is if you find somebody that's willing to switch with you, then that makes everything easier. So there's going to be five mornings of presentations. And uh, there is the option for those who just are traveling and other reasons to, um, to videotape your, your, your presentation for review. But of course, uh, th there's nothing like for your experience to doing it in class. So uh, having said all that, um, I got an example for you on welding. Um, it's a very large chain um, that I worked on a long time ago. And um, I think it ties in a lot of concepts that, um, that we've talked about. Um, over the past month again. Um, let's see if I can get it on there. Yep. So you can see the inspector. They, each link is about four or five feet tall. Um, and the reason for the rust here is they've exposed the, uh, the welded joint. So the way you make most chains is by starting with a flat bar a straight bar, and then you hot form it into a link, and then you have to weld that link on one side. So there's one side that there's a weld, the other side is just a plain section. Uh, it wasn't a fortunate event in the sense that those chains were used um, to um, essentially create enough pull force on um, um, deep, uh, deep water, um, oil production, oil and gas production equipment. So um, on the ocean floor, a lot of times there's, it's muddy. There's not a lot of structure to connect to. Um, so what they do is, let's say you drill a, a very deep well from the ocean floor and you want to make sure that things don't move around too much. So you, uh, you attach a big buoyancy can that gives a tension to keep everything straight up. Uh, so those chains were connecting a big balloon, essentially, 
So let's say you have a lot of production equipment. There's a lot of tubing going in all sorts of direction. There's pump, there's uh, valves, and then you get to this segment here that you want to keep straight. So you have that chain, and then you have a huge buoyancy can to keep everything straight up. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, the failure of the chain, and you can see it here, it, it essentially um, cracked at the welded joint, so at mid-height, and from that point, there's one side that bent and then let go the, the entire chain. Um, the chains were made, were just made, it was about a year old, and there was, a, of course, the question is why did it fail, and turns out in their installation, they had about five to eight of those chains, so when one fails, there's, you have more than one reason to look for the cause of the failure. You want to know if the others are also going to fail so you can repair them or replace them before uh, you have more damages. So um, just like we've talked about uh, last week, first step, if you can, if you have access to the fracture surface, you look at it. Uh, so in this case, it's relatively clean cut, so uh, again, the uh, the chain just broke where the, uh, the welded joint was. So you, um, let's say it's up to here, and you cut a piece out, and you look at it from the top. Uh, you see this fracture, so um, it's a little bit like the, um, the railroad axle example, where you see these beach mark for this section that's on the lower part here. You see a few of them right there. Um, so these, these marks right here are the different location where the crack was at different points in time. So the implication here is um, the crack grew slowly. This was not a brittle behavior where you, the chain was perfectly fine and then all of a sudden it broke. There was a crack that started somewhere around here and then grew to let's say about 40% of the entire cross-section area before you had the final failure when you got to this point. Um, so what do we have to learn there? Um, it's not really a pure overload in the sense that you were able to have a crack 40% through and the, the chain was still holding the load. So if somebody comes and says, well, there wasn't enough metal, or the metal didn't have a yield strength that was high enough, well, it doesn't quite work because, again, you were able to uh, take on probably um, twice as much load as there was if, if there wasn't any crack in this chain because it's really a big, it's a stress intensity. It's not just a stress concentration when you really have a pre-crack in here. It really reduces your, your strength of the remaining segment of the chain. Um, so what do we do? We know it cracked slowly. Um, it was from this area, and you can see this, the zone here that didn't rust, so it's not a big indication, but it, it has slightly different feature even visually. So we, we go and, and look closer and closer, different views, before we get too much into the details, because when you go to the microscope on a piece like this, you, you have to cut out a section first of what you're going to look at. So you spend a little bit more time deciding uh, which part you're going to be examining. Um, that was an interesting feature. So here we're looking after there was a little bit of piece cut out and you can see that there were two cracks. So there's the crack that actually broke and there was another crack underneath of it. Um, a lot of times when you have branches of cracks, different cracks, um, in a, it's, you know, it is a slow cracking process to get there, but it also is a lot of time related to the environment because what the environment does is allows you to grow cracks under constant load. You know, this chain, not a whole lot of load fluctuation. There's only so much air in the balloon. There may be a little bit of a temperature variation, but really nothing substantial to cause um, load variation, there wasn't any real vibration as far as I know in this component. So the reason why the crack grew wasn't fatigue from, you know, taking and, and, and removing the load, 
but it was under a constant load. So a lot of times when that happens, the environment has something to do with how the crack uh, started and propagated. Uh, without getting into the details of that, what I'll say is um, the shop process for making that joint here in the first place is um, a flash weld. So you, you arrive with a big electrode on each side. You, you draw enough current between the pieces that they, 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 they melt, and then you push the two pieces together. So all at once, you make a cross-section weld, you know, the piece about this big, just all at once. And the consequence of having so much heat is your cooling rate is relatively slow. You, you just melted a, the entire chain area. So after you fuse, it's cooling more slowly. Uh, now, what we found out in this specific case, if you look at the micrograph, so you ha he, this is a cross section through the crack. So the lower segment of the fracture with the, the, with the, uh, the upper with the lower, and then you have these little rounded region in the cross section, and you, you can probably see them better here. Um, these are passes of um, just a, a, a normal, smaller scale fusion welding process. Um, so what the conclusion was just after seeing this is, even though the shop was set up to make the weld all at once, um, the manufacturer admitted that they had um, an alternative process when things were not going well, because here you're relying on alignment, you're relying on drawing enough current, enough surface preparation, enough lineup of the two pieces. So when all of that didn't work, they um, sometimes were repairing those welds. So if you had an area that had a, a, an indication from uh, inspection, um, let's say ultrasonic inspection, they would grind off that indication and repair weld it. So, from what we see there, we can safely say that they, they had something of the order of half an inch. So on the entire section, um, they had something that was fairly deep. So there's this area, they just ground it off here. And then they, they had a notch and they filled it in. Um, so if when we look at it on a cross section, which is what we see there, let's say you had the two pieces, well, it was only one back then, so they made this notch in the piece where they had previously a little indication, and then they started filling it back up with multiple passes. So that's really what we're seeing. So, uh, at first, um, this is not great because it wasn't allowed by the specification to do these things. Um, but it wasn't really the major issue. The major issue is this steel was quench and tempered. So it was f flash welded and then heated back up, quenching oil, and reheated to get to this um, com uh, optimal microstructure that has a good strength and a good toughness, so both of them. So what happens in rewelding after the chain is completely done, you go through this cycle again and you essentially requench the microstructure. So this is a steel that can become brittle when it's cooled off quickly by quenching. So it forms this Martin site and um, they did not reheat the entire chain after this uh, local welding. It just went for putting the, the protection coating and all that. So, we we'll like to think that these situations don't happen, but um, they do. Even if this was a very critical uh, manufacturing, it was the, you know, the grade five, the, the, the highest grade change they could, they, could, they could buy is what they asked for. And then there's this process going on in the factory where they, they completely provided something different than what was specified. And it's hard to find. So the, the, the situation here is surface is ground off nicely. There's no crack indication. The manufacturer puts a very nice coating. There's, there's an aluminum uh, coating. Then there's this big coating on top. So there's no real way to know what happened under the, the, the coating.
Um, and you see how big the chains are. So the process of inspecting the welds for the chains after the fact involved taking the coating off and it would take a little bit like a day and a half per chain for the guy to just prepare the surface and, and do the inspection. And then um, they did find other areas that were weld repair, so ultimately they had to replace all the chains. Um, now, why did it crack? We kind of inserted in the sense that we have this Martin site in the welds. Um, so what that leads to um, microscopically is um, very faceted fracture surfaces. So this is not something that we're focusing on uh, this term uh, in this class, but um, can probably all agree that this looks very intricate. It's, it's not this dimple fracture that I showed last week where you have these little rounded area of microvoids combining together. This is just very, very different. So the way it differs is the cracks just finds these easy path of propagation. Let's say it's within the grain. It will follow very specific planes where it's easier to separate the, uh, the, the crystal, the, the steel crystal. And um, that's why it's, it's finding these orientation. Um, and here it's going between the grains. Um, so there's just a lot going on, and you can see a space between the grains. That's also typical of a certain form of embrittlement of the steel where um, the, the strength is so low that um, for crack propagation that the, a crack, a single crack will grow about the same speed as two cracks running next to each other. Even though intuitively, if you have two cracks, they have less driving force to grow, and one should die as opposed to the other. But it is the nature of this process where there's going to be a condition in stress cracking or environmentally assisted cracking where your crack growth rate is constant. Um, and I, I could show you some plots, but it will probably make it harder. So let's just think about this. So if you have the tip of a crack like this, and there's a little bit of plasticity. There's all sorts of things going on at the tip of the crack. And then you have to feed a certain environment to get your stress corrosion or your environmental cracking to take place. Uh, the idea here is so long as you got enough stress, so say the, say the stress is greater than a certain critical stress, the process of growing the crack is kind of a diffusion process. It's really the supply of reactant and getting rid of them at the tip of the crack. And that's why you have a constant growth rate. And that's why having two cracks or three cracks running in parallel happens in this case when it's not uh, typical on a, on a fatigue crack or so crack caused by cyclic loading. So here the load is constant. And there is a, a certain form of interaction. A lot of times it's involved hydrogen at the tip of the crack, or it could be that it's a protective film that, that is forming and breaking. But there is essentially reasons why you have a constant rate of movement and a lot of secondary cracks. So as soon as we start seeing all that indication, the very intricate pattern, the secondary cracks, we know it was related to the environment and then Turns out they were using a cathodic protection system, so they were impressing a potential on the entire chain so it doesn't rust. But that potential uh, favors the formation of hydrogen. And those features we see are you know, ass assisted by hydrogen to grow the crack at the tip, even though it's, you know, it's not like the water was specifically acidic. It's you generate the, the, the reaction by having the right potential. Um, at the right or wrong time. I mean, this, if, if this chain uh, had not been re-welded, the entire section of steel would be below a certain level where you don't start having these processes forming. You don't get that stress, for example, at the tip of the crack. So there is a critical amount of, of stress you need here to start having the hydrogen play a role. And um, a lot of time we rate that just in the hardness number that's related to the yield strength as well. But let's say you have a HRC, a Rockwell C hardness that's greater than 32 to 35 is where you start thinking 
that you may have some problem with uh, forming hydrogen at the tip of the crack if, if you have cathodic protection. Um, and that essentially means a lot of times uh, you need to temper the martensite. A martensite that's not tempered is going to have a, a hardness of about 55, so it just doesn't work. Now, in this case, we were finding values up to 45, I believe, just because um, they were trying to do big passes. I don't know if they preheated. So there were a few things they were trying to do to reduce the risk, but it wasn't enough. Um, any questions on that? Okay, um, so let's go back to um, a little bit more of the common manufacturing. I mean, this chain was just really, really big. So um, if you're making components for anything that's going to have to survive the environment, and again, we'll talk about corrosion more uh, this coming Monday, but what I, I want to say is a lot of times after making the parts, this is all assembled, it's got a, an end piece, multiple component, a lot of welds, you do uh, a coating. Uh, in this case, it really is cleaning up the assembly. So you soak it in acids to clean it up, get the rust out, and then you dip it in liquid zinc. Uh, the big chains that we just looked at were dipped in an aluminum-based uh, substance, so it was at a higher temperature, but the process was very similar where you come and uh, apply a sacrificial material on the surface. Um, what happens then is instead of corroding the steel, you corrode that zinc or what you're putting on, and therefore you don't lose section and you don't lose strength over time, but it will look rusty a little bit sometimes. Uh, for cars, uh, a lot of uh, body panels for cars are uh, galvanized, but it's a different process. They will do it on the sheets before the entire car is assembled. And um, there's a lot of implications of doing that. Uh, the first one is uh, paint for cars is just very important for the appearance, the aesthetic. So, and it's very hard to put paint on a galvanized surface, so they, when, what they do is, you see the process here, it goes through the bat, but there is also a big section where you reheat the zinc to um, um, essentially start oxidizing it, so it's a very rough surface and the paint is going to adhere to it. So even though we talked about um, you know, galvanized panel, it became very common, uh, for cars, you have a few things that are not all that perfect. The first one is when you weld two pieces together, you lose the zinc in that area. So let's say somebody has a paint job done because they had a little accident, then this area of repair a lot of times is, doesn't have any galvanizing at all. And that's why it rusts more easily after. You can probably tell that to your friends if you... Uh, and. Uh, the, 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 and the galvanizing that's put on is just very, very different. And when we talk about corrosion protection, of course, uh, depending what you're looking for, you have to specify uh, what kind of zinc or zinc aluminum uh, uh, coating that you're looking for. Okay, so I said I was going to give you a few examples that were different. Um, so I pulled out a video. Um, to show a thermal spray. Um, it's about a minute. So what you'll see here is um, it's, it's made by a robot. And um, you start with a, with a, a flame, so an oxyacetylene flame. Then you'll see eventually they start introducing the potter. So they're just adjusting the flame here. Oh, so this red portion is in the flame, they introduce spotter. It's fed through that gun. And right now they're just essentially stabilizing the process and then now they're coming down into the part. And they'll add a, a hard coating. This is similar to what we saw on the uh, 
railroad axle uh, where you you putting on this this potter uh, that's fed through the flame. So you start with a feedstock that's just an alloy, and then um, it's not a super fast process. And the way that they're showing it here, where um, you don't build up a lot of thickness through this process. Now you can modify it. There's other ways where you, instead of feeding powder, you really feed a complete wire and you have a lot more deposition going on quickly. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about these, these slight variation of it. Um, it's an industry that grew quite a bit over the past 20 years or so. Uh, You can use different types of heating mechanism in thermal spray to heat up the metal or the ceramic. So a lot of ceramics, and I brought a little bit of a turbine piece here. Um, if you're looking at high temperature applications, it's advantageous to, to coat um, a, a metallic base material with a ceramic, it gives you insulation, it gives you a, a, a greater heat resistance. Um, if you're um, wanting, for example, a, a part that has especially high conductivity on the surface, sometimes you'll coat uh, with copper or an aluminum alloy a different part. Um, so you have a, a very big range here of things you can do depending on the flame that you select. Um, here, the, the cold spray here, you see that the, the, the flame is pretty cold and you're not even melting the particles that you're feeding. So you, you're just really heating them up so they're soft and then you, you project them on the surface and start getting um, um, a buildup is, is, is what you're looking for. So this is really additive manufacturing but not in the sense of um, any you know chemical vapor deposition, physical vapor deposition, you really come with a lot more material all at once. Um, it's a little bit how uh, for a while they, they were able to keep uh, improving um, temperatures that you can that you can reach uh, with these processes. Um, there's a little bit of a timeline here. Yeah, it shows how you, they, it becomes a lot more sophisticated. So at this point, it's used quite a bit um, for wear resistance. So in the oil and gas industry, you have these big pieces of um, equipment that need to be wear resistant, but also you don't want them to break. So you do exactly what we saw in the video. You put half a millimeter of this coating on the surface that can be a, a very complex composite. Sometimes you feed silicon carbide particle along with a, a, a metallic binder to make really any, any combination you like. There's no limit on how you bring in different potters together to uh, make the surface. Um, <clears throat> a little bit more on the fundamental level because that's but my goal with you guys um, each particle in most processes is melted. I mentioned about cold spraying where particles just stay solid, but it's an exception. So most of the time it does get melted and you can see people do all sorts of simulation to explain what we find is we do find oxides, some unmelted particle and voids into these coatings. They are not perfect. Um, now, the fact they're not perfect sometimes helps you. Um, so there was a lot of study done on the thermal expansion of these coatings. And um, the biggest finding is you do want uh, a coating that has some voids and even some micro cracks so it actually is more able to expand and contract. Uh, during service than if it's monolithic. If it's, if, it's, if it's really consolidated, it will hold on and have nothing until it really cracks all the way through. Whereas if each layer here, when it's formed, makes these little tiny crack for each thickness, 
then um, you don't have the same net effect. You just have a more compliant structure. When you open it up, it's a little bit like a composite in parallel, so everything just stretches elastically. Um, so it's a, it's, it's, it's a specialized industry. So there's, um, there's a group in uh, ASM, American Society for Material. They, they're very active still in continuing to improve these processes and having them used in more applications. Um, it's not super cheap. And um, these little details here of micro cracks, just examples of what you get when you make a ceramic, um, it's not really structural. So there were discussions about making complete parts this way. And you could if it's metals. You know, we talk about cracks here, but these are for ceramics. For metal, I think the, the main implication is you have a lot of residual stresses because you're coming in, and each time you, um, you, you have to cool down all that material that you're depositing. So there's, there's always a shrinkage and a tension that's built up on the surface. Um, and you can't really avoid it. So a lot of times those coatings are going to be, you know, a millimeter thick or less. And each droplet, I could have said that, uh, would be like 50 to 100 micrometer, depending on what, what pot are you using and uh, a lot of details. But the idea is to be fairly efficient because by the time you're able to make potters, and that came out a little bit at the same time from polymer metallurgy that we're going to talk about. Um, if you can make polymers efficiently, then you need a gun that's going to heat and feed the polymer into the surface. Um, and you're putting coatings on. Um, maybe one thing to emphasize, see when you show the substrate here, it's a rough surface. And it's one of those parts that is very difficult. So they would use this process if you have an old bridge and you want to put a zinc coating on. It'd be so great to be able to go to the bridge and galvanize it. And it's done, but one of the big limitation is the surface preparation. So you'll have to sandblast that surface and keep it dry <laughs> until you're able to spray it with the zinc and then there's also a risk with liquid zinc. It's, it leads to fume and uh, uh, essentially health concerns. So there's, it, there's not a whole lot that's done in the field. You can do it. Um, a lot of times it would be for a local repair as opposed to doing an entire big surface. They'll love to do it, uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a lot of uh, limitations associated with that. Okay, so powder metallurgy, um, you probably know about it. It's used quite a bit in the automotive industry where you want to make gears or relatively, uh, you know, wear resistant component with complex geometry and machining them would be uh, quite involved. Um, a lot of tools are sort of been traditionally made this way. You take different powders together, um, tungsten carbide with uh, cobalt to make a drill bit as is kind of a I guess an ancestor to the, the modern uh, powder metallurgy so you have different powders that you mix together you compact it that would be your green part um, on the on the upper right and then you heat it up so when you when you heat it up what happens is this driving force to eliminate surfaces. So when we talk about sintering, it's really that we have these particles that are touching and they're being pressed together. So let's say by deforming, you got it like this. And a lot of time, the green parts, without any heating, will hold themselves, depending on the powder you use, because a lot of these powders are gonna be porous and very intricate, so you get a little bit of mechanical interlocking from all the parts coming together. But when you heat it up, the, you, now you have diffusion taking place, and what it means is a lot of these surfaces will want to disappear. So all of a sudden, you're going to really be fusing these two. So you eliminated this boundary between the two um, 
particles, and then you keep having diffusion. So you take material from this side to feed into the other side of the particle. So all of a sudden, eventually, you eliminate completely this region. Sometimes what happens is, let's say you start shrinking, and then eventually you don't have enough supply of material, so that's where you'll have a little porosity left. So um, through that sintering process, there's no guarantee that you're going to make a completely solid part. It depends on your processing parameters, the different size of the particles. Uh, a lot of times it's going to be okay. What um, probably is important to keep in mind is um, because of this sintering and the shrinkage of the part, it is difficult to have a very tight uh, dimension control. So you start and you press the part into a very, very specific shape and then you're relying on these diffusion processes to get to the final part where it's thinning down and it's shrinkage. So um, that's why if it's a gear, for example, you'll end up having to machine the exterior surfaces because you don't have the per a great uh, dimension control. Um, it's, a, it's, it's one reason, so they were trying to do a version of this that I'll talk about for um, jewelry. So you, you really design your jewelry and then you come and, 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 and make it into uh, a shape um, not this way, but the same idea is you just get dimension control when you're really trying to solidify here, and that's what leads you to variations that um, are not ideal. So advantages, make very complex part. A lot of times your microstructure ends up being very, very similar throughout. So you take these spotters and you press them, you center them, you don't get these dendrites or you know different grain size at the mid thickness of the part so it gives you a very homogeneous material but you you can't really um, get the, the optimal dimensions on the first place um, there was something else um, so you you can make a small variation of this when we talk about getting some porosity Let's say it's a titanium alloy and you really want it to get the maximum prop properties. Um, you can uh, use a HIP process, so uh, hot hydrostatic pressings. So you put the part in, at high pressure and that's going to favor, and, at, and temperature of course, it's going to, to favor uh, eliminating the remaining porosity. So that it's, it's done for certain castings and um, for part of metallurgy to get to the maximum density. So it's a very brief overview, um, a variation of it um, that's become popular and we've tried to use it for some of our prototyping for the technology we're developing is um, direct metal laser centering. So if you're not familiar with it, um, what happens is you put a little bit of a bed here of powder and then you come with the laser and melt locally the powder where you want to form the part. Um, and the remaining, so that's, that's the dark blue is what has been melted and then everything around it, is, it remains like sand. It's still a powder. So what happens in this process is you are able to form very complex shapes, and I, I wish I brought it today, I'll bring it next time. Um, you, you can have parts with holes in them, a, any kind of geometry, very high aspect ratio, so things that you wouldn't be able to drill, you're able to make them this way. Um, so the idea is keep, keep getting this surface refinished each time, so you have some fresh powder, and then you come and you decide, it's, it's a little bit like a printer. Uh, but it's a very small step each time. <laughs> uh, so it's not, yeah, let's put it this way, to make a part about well, this big out of titanium, it was 500 bucks or $800, but it will really give you any kind of geometry you like. And you're also able, one thing they do that I thought was really cool is you make a certain amount of this, and if you want a really, really good finish, 
they have a, a machining tool that comes with it. So they'll take the laser out, they machine the edges, and then you can keep going and depositing a little bit more. So there's, a, there's a almost unlimited uh, possibility to make very, very intricate parts uh, without casting them again. So everything we talked about getting an homogeneous microstructure, because what will you do? Well, in that case, it's not just sintering, so you're melting it. Um, you'll have some porosity. It's, it's not a perfect process. Um, this is a little bit the, 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 the feedstock, very small particle. Um, in this case, 30 micrometers. Um, so you put them there everywhere, and then you start forming Every piece of this gets melted and into a little pool. So we could think of this as just a little area that maybe we melted five to eight particles all together. We made a little bit of a, a, a liquid metal pool there and then keep going on doing the next area and the next area. Um, the, the dimension accuracy here, um, it has a little bit of a limitation, the same reason as you, you put the powder and it is going to shrink uh, on you and you'll be left with some porosity. Now, all these things you can work on and improve, but you're still left with the idea of starting from very, very tiny, you know, non-visible powder, very fine powder, to making parts. And at this point, we're talking about an inch or two that you typically will make this way. Uh, if you go way beyond that, the, the equipment's not really there, it will take a long time. Now, with time, you'll keep making them bigger and bigger, but um, I'm bringing it up just because a lot of times you think, oh, well, should I make this one this way? You know, well, <laughs> not right now, maybe in five, 10 years, and it probably you know, is going to continue to be expensive. So one thing that um, ties in here is whenever you can't just do cast iron to make this fitting, you, know, you decide you need steel because you need the toughness, or you can't use steel now, you're going to have a coating, you're always adding a step and you're adding cost. And, um, and this ties into Professor Eager's module. You know, a lot of times the, the final objective is economical, you know, this, you need to have a practical application. So you only use these things when it is the best economical option to fit the function. So you need, you need this coating on, on a part for appearance, corrosion resistance, wear resistance, go ahead and put it on. That's the thermal spray process. And if you don't have to use the potter, if you could use a wire, to feed into the flame, you'll do it because making wires, you know, a lot more eff effective. So it becomes a little, almost like a welding process. You feed the material, it gets heated. The only difference, it gets projected onto the surface. That really is the only difference here with the thermal spray. And with the, uh, the powder metallurgy, um, one disadvantage of powder metallurgy is you still need a form. You need a relatively strong mold to press the part, and that's something that you eliminate when you go to the direct laser sintering and you see all these little channels, um, but you have to do it very small quantity of the time, and you do need interconnection. So when we were talking about, uh, and these parts you can literally send, you send your solid work file to the vendor and he'll give you a price and you get it made. If you have an idea of something you want to build that's small, that's a good thing to do, but this example here, if you want to make this bottle type shape, well, you can't make a closed bottle unless you're willing to leave the potter in it. So there has to be an exit route for that uh, potter uh, at the end of the process. And that's a little bit what they have here. Um, so the, this channel can go all around if this is a full part, but you'll have to drain somewhere. And it actually can be tricky to get the, all the powder out of a, of a tiny hole. That's a problem we had uh, with what we were getting built. Uh, so 
Uh, I hope it was useful to you guys. Um, I'm going to go very quickly over what we've talked about. We talked about forming uh, uh, metals from liquids. So we had nucleation and all those things coming in. The, the, the type of surface that you have in the mold that's going to affect how you nucleate the, the dendrites and um, you'll have segregation. So a lot of times you have more alloying element in the very center of the part than on the surfaces. And that's by studying the phase diagram that you can know that. Uh, we talked about deformation processing, how to make beams. And actually, I tricked you because I bought this beam today and I'll circulate it. Um, that was not made completely by deformation processing. So you guys can have a look and let me know at the end what you think it is. Um, but a lot of times you'll have this process of, 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 of first melting the steel, then making a casting, having this deformation processing to make the structure regular. We talked about uh, having the grains reform and have the diffusion, so all the microstructure through the thickness is the same. And we've talked about when we have this part that's really, you know, all the dimensions we were looking for, we can do that heat treatment so we change. And the, I try to be blunt there, I said we have the range from 50 to 200 KSI or 30 to 200 KSI in terms of the yield strength we're going to get out of this part. And that was by heat treatment. We also talked about heat treatment for aluminum. That was a little bit the same story. You can go from 5 KSI or... 35 megapascal uh, all the way to 60 or even 70 KSI yield. So it's a very big factor, a factor of 12, in, 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 in how much strength you get if you do the proper treatment of your microstructure. We talked a little bit about es essentially injecting more carbon or nitrile in the surface to make the surface hard. And you can see those numbers here. Those numbers will lead you to um, the possibility to start forming cracks. Uh, if you have an aggressive environment and a, and, a, and a corrosion potential. So you have to be careful on your application if you start making these processes. We've talked about welding where it's the opposite of a heat treatment. When you weld, most of the time you are reducing the strength and the long-term resistance of the alloy. And um, I mean, all in here, what I want you to keep in mind is you have a lot of options. If you say, oh, okay, you can make this out of steel, well, okay, so there are so many. If it's cold form, you get good dimensional stability. If it's hot form, it was cool and it has a little bit more wrinkle in it. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do. You can have special requests for inspection. Um, Ultimately, you do want to have a match for this specific application. You try to optimize as much as possible to have the right material selection, the right way to do it, uh, and the right level of quality control. Sometimes it's very limited because it's pretty obvious how to do it. That was the example of those plumbing joints. You know, you have to put it in. As long as it's in, it's going to work. Um, welding is, you know, very different. There's a lot of intricacy to making a good uh, welded joint. And I hope that you've seen a little bit uh, when we start analyzing failures, how we can learn. So I started the semester with the World Trade Center as a big blown up case that was just, uh, uh, we've learned a lot from it. Uh, and hopefully the situation next time is just going to behave differently. Uh, now, um, with respect to a little bit more the, the ins and out when we're looking at those fracture surfaces, you know, there's some basic questions. Did it broke all at once? Was it brittle? Was it not brittle? Was the environment playing a role? How big, did you have a pre-crack? You know, all those things you can answer relatively quickly. And what I said about failure analysis, if you remember, is go and, and get some data because we can all be here talking about, okay, well, maybe this, maybe that, but you actually, Reviewing all the information you have, a lot of times, will give you some good ideas about what happened. Well, thank you. And summary due on Monday, 5 o'clock.